Oh my god, the orders are rolling in. We've got 6 SN7s, 6 SL7s, 12 AU7s, 12 AX7s, 6 N1Ps, 6 DJ8s, and somebody's even ordered 76s and 56s. How am I going to noise test all of these? Wait a second. I've got an idea. Now that's what I'm talking about. Hey everyone, this is Charles. And Jim. Here from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 168, we're going to take a look at our new prototype preamp for noise testing tubes. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them, and always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So that opening was a bit of a dramatization, as you can probably tell since I'm not much of an actor. But there is some truth to it. We sell a lot of tubes, not just in quantity, but also in variety. And we prefer that whenever a tube goes out the door, it's tested for noise in an actual circuit. Before now, we made great use of our universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp, since and it's- And our Wilsonton R8. And our Wilsonton R8 since uh, both of those are actually able to run a fairly decent variety of tubes. The Wilsonton R8 can do several major power tubes and the Universal can do a, a decent number of preamp tubes. But the variety was still limited and they're not always running them at the best operating point. So I decided that it's time to build something even more universal and this is what I came up with. What you're looking at is a fairly simple circuit. We have our standard dual mono power supply design that we use in all of our preamps, although we're using a different transformer here. From the power supply up through the voltage gain tubes into the cathode follower, it's all dual mono. And then, well, the cathode follower is also a 6N6P, which is fantastic. But this baby has a few tricks up its sleeve that none of our other amplifiers have. So first thing you're gonna notice, the sockets. Isn't this a weird arrangement? First thing we have here is our standard 8-pin octal um, socket, and it's on what's called the 8BD pin layout, which is just the same pin layout that you would have for a 6SN7 or a 6SL7. And a hundred other tubes. Uh, yeah, well, maybe not a hundred, but you know, the 12-volt equivalents, uh, some of the weirder stuff like a 6BX7. Uh, it's the standard pinout for all these different tubes. Basically, for the more common uh, um, twin triodes. Yeah, on an octal base. Yeah. So that's, that's what this is wired up for. And then we've got our nine pin socket, which is running on the nine A uh, pin out, which there's a, you know, there's probably half a dozen different variations of that, but essentially anything that's on a standard dual triode layout, like a 12 AU7, 12 AT7, 12 AX7, 6 DJ8, 6922, 7308. I mean, I can keep reading these off forever. There's a whole bunch of them here. They, they will all work in this socket. But then we've got these beautiful big US 5 pins here. And what are they doing here? Well, they're for some very early single, general, uh, single triode general purpose tubes, like the 27, the 56, and the 76. And they're very much the precursor to one half of what, what became a 6SN7. Exactly. It's something like the great, great, great grandfather of a 6SN7 tube. And we've been wanting to listen to these things for ages. So I thought, why not include them on here? And one of the tricks of this amp is how we are going to lamp these filaments, because they are operating on 2.5 and 6.3 volts. 6.3 isn't that... Um, isn't that uncommon, of course, it's one of the standards, but the way that we wired this up is really interesting, and Dad's going to talk about that in a bit. Well, we should back up just a little bit. So, what you've basically done is you've used each half of a twin triode mm -hmm. to create, create a right and a left channel. So, this 9-pin socket gives us the voltage gain for both channels, Yep. one half on each tube, and the same for the octal socket. But because he, uh, these five pin tubes are, are single, single triodes, we need two of them, two sockets. Yeah. So, so you can think of this almost like it's split down the middle and we have two mono amplifiers and we're splitting these tubes down the center and technically the cathode follower as well. And the cathode follower is another 
twin triode, a very yeah. capable twin and triode. And probably our favorite cathode follower too, the 6N6P, it's just perfect for it. Okay, so that's really interesting. And what you did to come up with the filament, uh, really, the filament wiring really is kind of neat. Let yeah. me see if I can perch that This here. is one of the tricks <laughs> to how this works. <laughs> there. Oh, there we go. So, what Charles wanted to do was to figure out how to run the 27 tube, and there's a whole host of tubes that run at 2.5 volts on the filament. And that's not a common switch mode. But what is a common switch mode is 5 volts DC. In fact, it's very common. Yep. Uh, most modern electro electro yeah. most modern electronics that have a USB power supply run off of 5 volts. Okay. So what we what we've got here is basically a series string. So what a series string is is a 2.5 volt filament, and I've drawn it as a resistor. So when you're doing electrical design, thinking of things in their simplest, lowest common de denominator helps in designing a circuit, and it's actually how circuit analysis is done. So think of a filament simply as a resistor with a certain amount of resistor. Re uh, resistance. <laughs> <laughs> resistance. We're really getting tongue-tied today. Yeah, well the weather is really different here. We went way below zero, which is unusual for our area. I think we dropped like 20 degrees in a day. It was our, pretty fun. Our big huge whole house humidifier dropped its entire tank of water <laughs> overnight trying to keep us moist. So anyways, we dried out some time in the middle of the night. So, here's the filament for one channel, here's the filament for the other tube in the other channel. When you series string a 2.5 and a 2.5 volt tube, you have a requirement now for 5 volts, which is a common switch mode. Now, when you do this, you can't, unless the tubes are specifically designed for this, and the 12AU and the 12AT and the 12AX7 series are, and the later 6SN7s. But a lot of tubes are not designed for this. So you can't do something like, I want uh, to run 6.3 volts, and you would put, let's say, a 4-volt filament tube. I don't know if a 4-volt filament tube even exists. But you can't do that because what will happen in a series string for tubes that are dissimilar is that the current draw of one tube will far exceed the other one and it it'll start to see stress really quickly it may not burn out right away but eventually it will so we're using the same socket for a 6.3 volt tube and because the circuit's hardwired yeah into this string um, that means that the six six volt switch mode is not going to work for this right because it's only going to essentially provide half of the voltage required so, a 12-volt switch mode is a very common switch mode, so that's what Charles runs. Anyways, this is something that's been done going way back. I think it was very commonly done with um, budget TV filament wiring. And what the early TV manufacturers wanted to do was save money on a huge expensive filament transformer because there are a lot of, TV, a lot of tubes and TVs. They draw a lot of combined current, mm -hmm. and the transformer to run them would have been very expensive. So, what they did was, if they were aiming for a market with 110 volt or 111 volt household mains, that was the earlier standard voltage, somewhere around there, maybe 114 volts. We didn't come up to 119 volts until, mm, I'm not sure, 60s or 70s, anyways. Um, so what they would do is they would series string enough tubes to equal 110 volts AC. Yep, and, and there would be no stepping down or stepping up or anything required. And because they would often end up with odd voltages on a large series string, they actually got manufacturers to make a specific place holding or filling in. Essentially just a filament in a glass bottle. Yeah. Just to add a little bit of voltage requirement on there. Essentially a trimmer. Isn't that cool? Anyways. And that's also the reason why you see a lot of t uh, TV tubes these days with odd filament voltages. 35 volts, 25 volts, 50 volts, things like that. Is because they were trying to make up that voltage difference to get it up to mains voltage. So 
That is one of the neat tricks that we did with this. Of course, it only applies to the five pin sockets. The, uh, the octal, the nine pin socket are wired as they should be. And the next trick we have on this is that we actually have these two two pole, fourth row rotary switches. It's actually the same switch that we're using on the headphone amp, uh, the prototype headphone amp that's soon gonna be a kit headphone amp, so stay tuned for that. We use it there for our output impedance switch. But here, what we're doing is we're switching out the plate resistors and cathode resistors for all of these tubes. So we can tune the circuit to exactly what those tubes like to run at. And it's been working great. We actually only have three of the four spots populated on both switches and it can run a huge number of tubes already. We've been listening to a great number, including the 76, which we're really excited about, and it just sounds fantastic on here. And another tube that really turned my crank was the 6N1P. Oh yeah, well... And we're gonna do a whole show on the 6N1P, and we'll listen to the 6N1P. It's a tube I identified years ago and bought up a lot of inventory for, mm -hmm. and it's basically a, a unique, a medium U, a twin, triode medium U Soviet tube. It's very similar to the 6DJ8, but it has a very unique sound compared to all the other versions that we've listened to. And electrically, it really doesn't have much of an equivalent um, that you could say this is a copy. It's, it's a Soviet tube that was essentially developed by them, and which is kind of unusual because they did an awful lot of copying of Western tubes. In fact, everybody copied everybody. Yeah. But, um, it's one of those tubes that develops independently, and as a result, it's uh, pretty much a unique tube, both electrically and sonically. And when you hear it as a preamp tube, I think you're going to get excited. Yeah, it, it just sounds so, so good. Uh, the second we listened to it in the original headphone app, we knew it was special, and when we listened to it again in here, it, it just brought that point home again. All right. Well, well done, Charles. I mean, this is this is excellent because... We can cover now, what, well over 90% of all of our shipments, we can actually listen really, really closely for the noise floor. All these preamp tubes, yep, we can test pretty much all of them. Pretty much all of them. All right, so I'm gonna clear the deck here and you can show us what came in. Oh yeah, and some really nice stuff came in. I think you'll add it in. Okay, well, let's get this all lined up and looking nice and neat. Okay, so I think we'll just come in here. Okay. Well, some beautiful tubes came in, and you probably know what these are. <laughs> so let's take a look at this, because you might not know what this is. This is probably the greatest 6SN7 ever made. It's a 6SN7GT. So it can't play in just any 6SN socket. It's essentially the grandfather of what everybody knows as the Sylvania bad boy, which is also, of course, a GT tall bottle. But this, if the, if the bad boy is a tall, tall boy, this is an extra tall boy. Yep. And we should have actually pulled one out to compare it. But anyways, it's not quite as tall as this. And it doesn't have um, a full chrome dome like this because the getter is at the bottom. Now, this is the Loctal version. They were all made, as far as we know, because dating these is tough because we don't get a lot of military boxes with good dates on them. But I'm pretty sure that this was the very first generation of Loctal tube. So they were made in the second half of the 1930s. So about 36, I think, to 39, mm -hmm. maybe into 40, 41, but I think that's probably it. Yeah, the, I mean, the Loctal standard came out right at the exact exact same time that the Octal standard did. They were competing with each other. Yeah, and the Sylvania, of course, developed it thinking that they could make an improvement on the Octal. And I have a feeling they were trying to get away um, from what everybody else was doing. And Sylvania was a huge military supplier. So Loctal, of course, comes from the fact that the tube was designed to lock. There's the lock right there. Um, was designed to lock in the socket and not bounce around and fall out. And of course, for military applications, that was quite an important consideration. 
Um, the bad news, of course, is that people couldn't get their damn tubes out. <laughs> <laughs> and because of the small pins, it was hard for them to have the, the correct tolerances on the sockets in, in that day and age. Yeah, so um, problems with noise and bent pins and stuck tubes pretty much killed the format except for military applications. So what we do is we rebase these and we put a high quality um, octal base on onto here. We remove this. It's a proprietary pro pro <laughs> proprietary. It's a proprietary method because it took us months and thousands of dollars in development work to figure out how to do it properly. And it takes a lot of time. And it takes to. a lot of time. But in the end, you can buy a new old stock premium uh, rebased loctal tube mm -hmm. as a success N7 basically for less money than um, a lower grade new old stock or probably about the same money as the used equivalent in an octal version. Yep. Was that confusing? <laughs> it was. So even though they're expensive, what you're getting is fabulous. And these tubes have a unique sound, very similar to the bad boy with a very open, clear sound. It's almost like this, the music comes out of a complete black background. It's, it's like everything that makes the bad boy great turned up to 11. And yeah. we've, We've had a number of customers purchase these and I think almost every single one that has bought a pair of them What have they done? They come back and buy more <laughs> right away <laughs> and send notes and say wow I can't I can't take a chance. That I won't have these are expensive. I can't take a chance. I won't have them um, and um, The one thing we forgot to mention is the bad boys are truly loved because of the definition of the bass. And now we're not talking about thumpa 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 bass. We're talking about well articulated, very detailed, very natural sounding bass. Yeah. Well, these go to 11 on that as well. Yeah. So what else came in? And this is the rebase number that we use. Yeah. So this one's waiting to have its bass pulled off. Well, this is probably the best EL34 ever made. They are expensive. Years ago, when I first got into this business, they were expensive, and then they became even more expensive. Um, and power tubes just don't live as long as um, preamp tubes. And as a result, vintage power tubes are always going to be expensive and get more expensive because the, the quantity of them available just goes down constantly. So this is a rebranded Mullard EL34 XF2 series. These were all made in the 1960s. Phillips, of course, owned Mullard and had owned them since the 1930s, I believe. I think they bought them in 37. Um, and Phillips owned pretty much all of the, uh, the major European manufacturers eventually, with a few exceptions. And of course, they wanted market share, but they bought high quality tube manufacturers in France, in Germany, in the US, in, in Canada, in Canada. Eventually they bought out Sylvania, they bought Rogers tubes and that gave them market share. They gave them access to uh, the really lucrative military contracts, mm -hmm. uh, essentially a lock on it. Anyways, um, you can tell an XF2 series because it's got a hole in the bottom. It's hard to see on camera if you can really see that. And of course they've got Hopefully they've got their etched codes. New old stock like this, new in the box, will. So, and it'll have a capital B, which is Blackburn. And the other, the other numbers get us the, um, the month and the year of production. So, over here we have the real deal. Well, the other one's the real deal. But here we've got a real Mullard vintage box. And they are not very common anymore. Um, and BVA just stood for British Valve Association. And here's the other end of the box. And let's take a look. Now, we haven't opened this box. It, it came in a little while ago. We're hoping the right tube's in there. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be a single O getter, which is my preferred type. This is how they, um, many of the XF2 series came wrapped. I don't know if they all did. And... The packaging is really quite good. It's designed so that the tube can survive bouncing around in the mail during shipping, during storage. And there we go. Isn't that gorgeous? 
and you can tell right away the chrome dome is fully intact there's no sign at all that the vacuum has bled off any of the gettering at all the label is perfect let's see if our factory codes are intact there we go and they are and it is an xf2 b0 now that here's where the problems <laughs> start because the tubes were made the xf2 series were made between 1960 and 1971 maybe into 72 so this could be a night because the code year code is zero it could be a 1960 or it could be a 1970 <laughs> and given the label and the box, I'm going to guess that this may actually be a 1960. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Muller did switch to a new logo later on that was more angular. So yep. it's probably a 60. And of course, the XF1 and XF2 series had a welded or attacked plate. And the XF3 and 4 series had really ugly... Um, sort of bent metal tabs. Yeah, people call them rivets or punches. Mm -hmm. And of course they were trying to save money so and we specialize for the x in the xf2 series because they simply are they're the best they're the best well if you stay to the very end here's some discount codes to help you out remember we can reach almost everyone around the world with flat rate shipping of twenty dollars if your order is 150 dollars or more after discount the shipping is on us folks and there's a secret code down here that people have been getting. It's really easy to figure out and it's been costing us big bucks. But I'm always happy to see returning customers and viewers grab a discount. So go for it. <laughs> this is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.